Dr. Morton devoted his life to medical innovation on behalf of his patients. And we're proud to announce that our awardee has spent his whole life in much the same way. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Amos Lal, a critical, a critical care medicine and pulmonary physician at the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. His major clinical and research interests include artificial intelligence in critical care, clinical informatics, infections in ICU, COVID-19 related research, quality improvement and outcomes related research in sepsis. His other areas of interest include improvement in healthcare delivery in the underserved areas internationally by providing clinical care and teaching in developing countries. Dr. Lau's lecture is entitled, COVID-19 from acute pandemic strain to public health nuisance. In this lecture, Dr. Lau will discuss the practice variability during the COVID-19 pandemic and the effects of practice variability in patient-centered outcomes. He will also detail learning from mistakes and moving forward. Please join me in congratulating and welcoming Dr. Amos Lau. Very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Are you able to hear me at the back? Fantastic. Um, thank you, Madam President, and uh, rest of the uh, Southern Medical Association. I'm very grateful and humbled to be awarded uh, the Morton Research Award for 2022, and I look forward to interacting with you in uh, the time that I spent here at the conference. Um, during my presentation, I will be uh, discussing our experience about COVID-19 pandemic, the mistakes that were made, how can we come out of it in a better shape than how we went into it. We will be discussing also uh, some strategies about development and advances in evidence-based medicine and how could these be disseminated to care better for our patients. Most importantly, the closing slide would be talking about humanism in medicine, which ties in very well with the introductory um, comment from the president, the reason why we all went into the uh, practice of medicine is to care for our patients. And that is really the gist of it all. I have no relevant disclosures. So I'm gonna start off with prediction of uh, unusual, uncommon events. During the pandemic, Situations like this arose quite commonly. People were able to retrospectively uh, furnish information or were able to provide evidence that things could have been avoided because of the predictions that were made many, many years ago, even centuries ago. Now, were these facts based on evidence or were these facts based on just imagination um, has been discussed in detail. And the next slide will tell us how. When, when uh, claims such as these were brought forward, uh, many societies, medical communities, et cetera, went on to look for whether there's any reality in these or not. And it turned out that a lot of these claims were actually false. Now, this was not just limited to gaining limelight in media and attracting attention um, for the personal benefits, but there were a lot of unfortunate events where people tried to provide information which was not factually accurate, leading to more damage than actually good. So let's get some definitions out of the way. 
what is misinformation, what is disinformation, and what is fake news. You know, terms like this really have caught a lot of attention and have been used very commonly. Misinformation is inaccurate information without a clear intent, whether it was given to harm somebody or it was just false and was unchecked. This information, on the other hand, is deliberately misleading. It is incorrect and has a lot of downstream effects which might harm few people to few communities to countries and even at global levels. Now, on the other hand, public health is actually a science of protecting and providing health to the communities and general population in a way by promoting or improving their lifestyle. This involves improving research done in the areas of public health in terms of implementation science, in terms of providing more equitable as well as more beneficial uh, healthcare to communities which are especially underserved. Now, considering all this, the same idea uh, still pertains. The idea of public health, medicine in general, is to provide care to our patients. And that the underlying fabric to that is to provide the best health care, which is based on real evidence. And the evidence needs to tell us the truth. What that means is that we have to tell the same truth to our colleagues as well as to our patients so that the shared decision-making that happens is actually based on real facts and real science instead of um, just ideas which are really not based on uh, real facts. Now, how these two types of information progress is also very interesting. When a real scientific literature comes out, it quickly gains traction, reaches a peak, and then the peak fizzles out real quickly. As the time progresses, the cascade size either decreases quite significantly or stays at a plateau. Whereas if there is a misinformation which provides some sensational, albeit inaccurate facts, it gradually increases over, over the time and then it continues to rise and the effects of this inaccurate information and the sensationalization that comes with it actually grows over time and it requires a lot more effort to undo the damage than the truth which is provided by real scientific peer-reviewed literature. So clearly we were not prepared and clearly we could not predict it, but for the future, could we be better prepared than how we were in 2020? Now, to do that, US task force came out with a few recommendations. Their data and the information which was collected on a global level figured out that few countries did a little bit better than some other countries. And what were the steps taken for that? The idea for that was we need to not be able to predict the future, but that's okay, but at least we should be prepared for it. We should have a collaborative effort. And the idea is that we actually come forward with should be based on real evidence, which are scalable and provide uh, better healthcare. So we are at this point in the fourth revolution. The first industrial revolution, which was in the 1700s, was more industrial revolution, followed by electricity, which came up, and then the computer revolution, which was in the late 1990s. And from then on, with the quantum computing, the dissemination of information and technology has progressed to such a fast pace that it takes a matter of milliseconds for information or the data to be produced in one place for it to be disseminated worldwide and globally. Now, it is a two-edged sword. It could actually be of benefit to a wider community of people, but if the information that is conveyed by it is not true, it could really be detrimental. So while we are in the fourth revolution, the idea is that we can either use it for our benefit or if we are not good stewards of the resources provided to us, be it the data or the literature, it could really turn detrimental. Now, I'm gonna start with presenting our first paper from Mayo Clinic, which came out in the beginning of the pandemic. And this was a, a 
data which uh, showed that out of close to 900 admissions that were uh, at Mayo Clinic Rochester, our overall mortality for all these patients was just 7%. The patients who were critically ill from that group, the mortality was a smidge higher, but still just 11%. That doesn't sound too terrible. The idea was the, the teams that were based at uh, the clinic in Rochester decided to stick to the basics. We did not really try to do something which was unusual. These patients were definitely sick, but we stuck to our basic practices. What are the practices for which we have the best evidence? Lung protective ventilation, providing antibiotics early, use of steroids in selective cases, proning, uh, best strategies for management of uh, ARDS, et cetera. So it seemed like common sense. And at, th at that time, we were still in the phase where the data was just coming out. There were not a lot of randomized uh, control studies at that time evaluating what is the new strategy or what are the new treatment options or therapeutic options for COVID-19. So preliminary data showed that, yes, the strain is troublesome. People were getting overwhelmed with a lot of patients, but the mortality was not too terrible if we stuck to our best practices. Now, how did things go on? Now, this slide actually represents the history of pandemics over many, many years, over centuries. Not going too back, the really ugly pandemics uh, from Spanish flu uh, costed us about 40 to 60 million mortalities. HIV AIDS, which was in the late 80s, uh, had a mortality in the range of uh, 30 million or more. And then came COVID in 2020 or late 2019. And at the time where this graphic was generated, we were somewhere between 40 and 50,000. Now in October of 2022, that number has reached to 6.5 million people at the moment, which is unfortunate, of course, but how did we get there is the big question. Had, if we had already figured out if we stick to our best practices, the mortality in these patients could be controlled, but that somehow did not happen. And in the subsequent slides, we will see how. Um, I apologize for the dark nature of uh, uh, this slide, but I hope you're able to see the major points on this. This is the database or the dashboard, which was actually created by Johns Hopkins in the very beginning of the pandemic. And it was real time and had global information for all the patients from not just the United States, but all over the world. As of 24th of October, total deaths top over 6.5 million. Uh, but as you can see with the graphs on the left of the screen, once our preventative uh, care improved, the spikes were not that high and the mortality has actually diminished over time. Now, for the next few slides, I'm going to follow these uh, bullet points. So why did this happen? Uh, Rob, next slide, please. This was our uh, group uh, which worked on how the practices uh, of our basic modalities of providing support to these patients were worldwide. So our group uh, at Mayo Clinic collaborated with multiple hospitals in the United States, starting off with uh, Boston University. And then in collaboration with Society of Me uh, Critical Care Medicine, we created uh, a consortium, which now has about 306 hospital sites in 28 countries uh, globally. What we wanted to see how is the practice of caring for these patients is not just in the United States, but all over the world. Now, these two caterpillar plots will show us that the use of NIV or high flow nasal cannula oxygen in these patients range from 0% to all the way 70% in certain hospitals. So you see some hospitals are very reluctant in do using these strategies where are certain hospitals on the far uh, left of the screen are very comfortable in using these uh, strategies for the care of these patients. Now, it is to be understood that all of these patients, all of these hospital sites had a lot of patients with COVID-19 disease, but some were just not comfortable. Either it was a knowledge deficit or the lack of resources or just the confusion of the pandemic per se. So things were not really uniform. There was a lot of practice variability from one hospital to the other, and that really translated to bad outcomes in a lot of these patients. This was the data which we presented in the 50th uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine Congress um, 
where we describe the outcomes of about 20,000 of these patients from uh, uh, our global network. And it showed that if somebody is not needing a lot of support, the mortality is actually pretty low, just close to 8%. If the patients continue to get worse and require multiple interventions, the mortality can go up as high as 70%, which means then one, one out of uh, three, three out of the two out of three patients will uh, sustain uh, mortality during the current hospitalization. So the risk adjusted mortality range range from 40% in certain centers to as high as 71%. And a lot of this uh, variation in mortality was not just explained on their disease severity. A lot of these patients had uniform disease, very similar disease, but some hospitals had low mortality, whereas the other hospitals had very high mortality. And this is another caterpillar graph which demonstrates the same point. The mortality on, on the uh, right side of the screen, on my right, shows mortality in the range of 25 to 30%, whereas in certain centers, the mortality range close to 75%, with the same population or very similar population of COVID-19 patients who suffer from ARDS, renal failure, or multi-organ failure, et cetera. And this is really the crux of it. When we did an artificial intelligence guided uh, cluster identification of how the care was provided to these patients, this gets the point through. Now on the top left corner of the screen, you can see the cluster plots of different types of interventions or the treatment options that the patients were given in the beginning of the pandemic. And as you can see that the top left corner is far more busy than the right bottom corner. What the top left corner is demonstrating here is there was so much variation in treatment options. Each cluster is showing what the people were doing. There were at least eight to nine clusters where people were trying to do all, so all sorts of interventions which were not really evidence proven. And there was a lot of variability. As the pandemic progressed, there was a very clear demarcation. The cluster actually separated very clearly. A lot of people were following evidence-based medicine. There was, whereas there was a very small cluster which was still following some interventions which were not really evidence proven. And that demonstrated with in a significant drop in mortality, which we'll be able to see on the next slide as well. So in the beginning of the pandemic, your mortality risk was super high, but as in, we saw in the previous slide, the, our practice made uh, clear sense and people were moving away from unproven therapies, the mortality actually decreased quite significantly. And this is the data from the middle of this year. Now, why did this happen? Why were people trying to do all sorts of things which are not really evidence proven? So the question is, is the information unavailable or is the information unclear? Are people not able to interpret the information that is available? So what is the problem with getting the information to be available to everybody? Now, to make all the literature or the, uh, the papers publicly available or open access, is that the solution? Will that solve the problem? Over many years in the past few decades, there has been a problem. A lot of medical journals tend to publish a subscription model, which means that the, uh, literature which is published is not publicly available to everybody. But in the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of publishing houses resorted that, you know, because it's a medical emergency, it is a pandemic, and people need information to be freely available, they moved to a model where they tried to make this information publicly and freely available to everybody. So instead of going all, all the papers or medical literature going into black hole, where only a few people are able to access, they made it publicly available to everybody. Now, that is also helpful, but could be misconstrued, where a lot of research that is published is not really peer reviewed, or if it is peer reviewed, the quality of literature is not the greatest. So there were some problems with it, but it was still uh, overall, I think a positive impact that people were able to showcase their research, their initial or the preliminary findings, if they think are going to be helpful to the patients to make it publicly available. And our group also decided that whatever we are going to publish, we should be able to transmit that information to a wider global community as soon as we can. So our group decided to make uh, steps for each of our publication that goes out should be publicly available to most of the people, if not everybody. So National Academy of Medicine then decided 
that we have to at least start a few initiatives that would kind of sustain this effort. Their main motives of this was to provide advocacy and social justice, to improve equity and healthcare delivery, to improve research, and to curate information, to collaborate whatever information is being generated uh, in terms of medical literature to be available to everybody and freely. And then uh, to promote leadership, public health surveillance, as well as uh, teaching and mentorship, which I'm, I'm very uh, happy to know that the SMA has the similar inclination and this aligns very well uh, with what uh, National Academy of Medicine is actually doing as well. Now, in 2020, this graphs actually show that the number of randomized controlled trials for studying the effect of medication or treatment outcome actually skyrocketed. This was primarily for COVID-19 related research. However, it was not the same for other research as well. So the unintended side effect of this was while the COVID related research actually increased, there were a lot of uh, issues that were faced for the research which is not COVID-19 related. And some of our data is, is yet to come out. We, uh, in our ICU, we have realized that while the COVID-related research was actually increasing, we were able to enroll more and more patients for COVID-19-related clinical trials. But the trials which are not related to COVID-19 could be related to our best practices in the ICU, such as sedation, et cetera. The number of recruitment for those clinical trials actually declined quite significantly. And that could be related to excessive strain on the healthcare staff, which is uh, caring for these patients some confusion in patients and the families while they are in distress. They don't want to be uh, carrying additional burden of research uh, while their loved ones are actually sick. So while this medical literature is getting more and more available to everybody, how do we interpret this? Is the interpretation of medical literature is same to me as well as to somebody else who's reading the same paper or not? Now, when there is no uniformity in that, that's where the real confusion arises. Now, if there is a way that we can do the synthesis of medical literature in a more meaningful way, where everybody is reading the same paper and coming to the same conclusion, that would really uh, hit the mark. Now, this is the slide, which is very important, the, the traditional structure of uh, evidence-based has been the lowest level of uh, uh, medical literature is case reports, case studies, followed by case control studies, followed by observational studies or large cohort studies, and then the clinical trials. And the apex of it at the top of the medical literature is your systematic review and meta-analysis. The group here proposed a different paradigm to this. They said there is not a clear cut demarcation in terms of the quality of evidence. Your good or well done cohort study or an observational study could be as good as a, as a clinical trial. So there is a lot of overlap. And then systematic review and meta-analysis, instead of being at the top of the hierarchy of your medical literature, it is actually a lens that can help you see what these uh, different types of studies are talking about. The systematic reviews and meta-analyses are actually a tool which will help you interpret the medical literature in the, in the case of uh, cohort studies and uh, randomized controlled trials to synthesize it all together and present it to the masses who may or may not be uh, well-versed in evidence-based medicine and to curate the guidelines for medical literature. Now, this group uh, came up with grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation. So this group decided that we are going to collate all the medical literature, including your observational studies, randomized controlled trials. We are going to rate the evidence of uh, treatment or outcomes for these uh, diseases, and then going to give them whether this is a good uh, degree of certainty, medium degree of certainty, or low degree of certainty. That way, the clinician, whoever is at the bedside, whether trained in evidence-based medicine or not trained in evidence-based medicine should be able to make sense of it and use it for better care of their patients. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna be talking about how can we do it better. Now, the book, uh, Republic of Plato, I'm not sure uh, if it is very commonly read, but was drafted in uh, 300 BC. The idea that was put forward was that there should not be a lot of overlap between what people do. The artists should do their artwork. The politicians should do the politics. 
and then uh, the manual laborers should just do manual laborers. And I think we have taken it to heart. Now, people who practice medicine, they just practice medicine. People who are full-time researchers, they are just full-time researchers. And then that brings in a lot of disconnect. People who are at the bedside and are not very well versed with evidence-based medicine sometimes are unable to make sense of what is published. Now, what we proposed in the new EBM or the evidence-based paradigm is to first of all, simplify what we present. The data that is presented is, if it is more meaningful and is able to digest, is better for the clinician who's at bedside, whether they're trained in e evidence-based medicine or not, but if they're able to appraise it appropriately and apply, will definitely have high degree of certainty and will improve the delivery of healthcare. Now, what GRADE does is they divide the studies, whether they are randomized or they're not randomized, and then give initial degree of certainty, whether the evidence that they are giving is actually true or how far away is it from true. And then they rate it very low, low, moderate, or high. Then the next step is the risk of bias. It could be selection bias, could be inconsistency, it could be indirectedness, or whether the publication was actually had some publication bias. If it is coming from, let's say, a small center versus a big center, the publishing houses may have different opinions on publishing that data. Now, there are certain domains which could actually increase the certainty of evidence if there is a dose response or if there is a large effect. And then after making all these assumptions or making all these calculations, the society or uh, the working group will give a recommendation that evidence for intervention X has a high degree of certainty and should be used in the care of the patients versus it has a very low certainty. And we will leave it to the bedside clinician to see whether it makes sense to be helpful in their patients or not. Now, I'm sorry for the busy slide, but this is a vision that we actually thought of. Uh, let's say if there is a clinical problem, you start by asking uh, the clinician, what do you think we should do? And then we go to the guideline developers and then they go through the entire grade framework. And then they give us the recommendation for whether the treatment should be used for a patient or not. Now, if we are able to create a live dashboard where all the evidence that is created for a certain disease or a plethora of diseases can be condensed into a live dashboard, it could be used as an educational tool. It could be used to train our future clinicians as well as uh, stakeholders, not just the clinicians, but the guideline developers as well as the patients. In the final uh, few slides, whatever has happened, probably not the ideal way, but can we come out of it in a better shape than when we went into it? And I'm gonna introduce the concept of antifragile. What does antifragile actually mean? So the term was actually given by one of uh, this very renowned writer from uh, New York, who has a background in um, Wall Street trading, and then went into philosophy and decision-making theories, et cetera. So the antifragile is the opposite of fragile. So fragile is if a bad event happens to us, and then if we are in a good state, it decreases our uh, 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 benefits, or it, it causes more harm than benefit, then we are in a fragile state. A resilient state is, for example, a clinician who's working in a busy ICU, you expose them to more and more patients, more and more workload, but the physician is resilient and you don't suffer any negative side effects of it. So that would fall under resilient. The antifragile on the other side is not just stable or fragile. Antifragile is something that actually benefits from volatility, anything that benefits from disorder. And this is the perfect example during the COVID-19 pandemic. Certain hospitals and certain group of uh, practitioners who were really overwhelmed could not cope well with it, but there are a certain group of people who actually use this opportunity and this volatility to improve, to conduct very high quality of research, create good evidence and improve the care for patients, not just now, but in time to come, not just this decade, but in the future as well, by creating various platforms for research, platform from, for healthcare delivery, as well as um, collaboration at multiple international sites. Now, this is the example for what we did. In the very beginning of the pandemic, in 2020, March and April, we decided that 
The information is going to be very essential and creating the right amount of information with accurate statistics is going to be very, very crucial. The, we collaborated with our group at uh, Boston, and then we started with Society of Critical Care Medicine to enroll multiple sites, not just in the United States, but internationally as well. The last time I checked, we had about 306 sites in more than 28 countries. We have a live dashboard, which provides how many patients are getting admitted and what level of uh, support that they are actually receiving and how do these patients fare as the time goes. How many of these patients get to go alive outside of the ICU? How many of these patients actually get discharged from the hospital? And where do these patients actually go? And is there a way to longitudinally follow these patients to see whether the interventions provided to these patients were actually benefit, uh, provided benefit? And if there is anything else that we can do differently for these patients? Collecting this data would actually provide us in the form of uh, uh, more rich information to conduct future uh, studies to improve uh, um, healthcare. Next, please. Next, please. So based on that, the group has actually created a live dashboard where all the interventions, the evidence for this use of corticosteroids, tocilizumab, uh, antiviral agents, remdesivir, fluoxamine, et cetera, the patients or the clinicians can actually click and it will give them the breakdown of all the studies that have been actually included in this and what is the quality of certainty? What level of certainty is there for the use of, for example, convalescent plasma? This is not just accessible to clinicians, but this is also accessible to the patients as well who are able to choose that, hey, my physician is recommending this, but let me click and find out whether it is actually gonna be beneficial for me. And then comes the shared decision-making. They can have a more open conversation that the evidence says this, I fall into this category, whether this, is, uh, this intervention is going to be beneficial for me or not. So the final step is actually to extend ourselves. Once we have this information, how can we transmit it to the other, other people uh, outside of uh, our own centers, outside our own state, outside our country at a global level? Our group has a certain program, which is a checklist for early recognition, treatment, and acute illness and injury, where we have a checklist-based approach to all the patients who get admitted with the critical illness. Go by A, B, C, D, E, F, including family, uh, have a very standardized approach to these patients, sticking to the best practices. And the evidence is actually shown once when we stick to our checklist-based approach, the mortality of these patients is actually much lower as compared to uh, the approach taken, which is very haphazard. It also showed that the chances of readmission to the hospitals are much lower as well. We upscaled that same approach during the acute stress of pandemic when we reached out to our colleagues in New York, where there was overwhelming uh, resources strain and people were not getting care, not just in their hospitals, people were in, um, uh, in the corridors and medical students were uh, forced to come in and pitch up and provide care when they're not even trained for that. So what did we do? We reached out to the New York uh, State and the licensure was actually uh, rapidly uh, fast-tracked. We provided care to the multiple hospitals in New York with two times rounding with the use of our telemedicine platform. Uh, example of our fourth revolution where we're using technology to our benefit. We did not uh, go there in person. We were able to discuss cases with them twice a day, eight o'clock in the morning, 8 p.m. at night. We do uh, virtual rounds with them, go through a very checklist-based approach. There is no need for us tonight, note because the teams are there who are on the ground and are able to do that. We were also able to extend our availability in between these two timelines as well, in case there's anything new comes up, if there is anything that we can help you with in terms of our cognitive uh, support, we were very happy to do that. And then the hospitals, uh, including New York Presbyterian, Well Cornell, they were very thankful for our uh, support during this acute uh, phase of strain. Um, and we still continue to have a close collaboration with them on multiple projects. Next slide. So this is what finally matters. I'm quoting this paper, which was about 100 years ago. Um, Dr. Francis uh, Pebri actually wrote this paper about humanity in medicine, and this is what eventually it boils down to. I'm going to read this uh, uh, whole uh, 
spot. Disease in man is never exactly the same as disease in an experimental animal, for in man, the disease at once affects and is affected by what we call the emotional life. The physician who attempts to take care of a patient while he neglects this factor is an unscientific as an investigator who neglects to control all the conditions that may expect his experiment. The good physician knows his patient through and through, and his knowledge is bought clearly. Time, sympathy, and understanding must be lavishly dispensed, but the reward is to be found in that personal bond which forms the greatest satisfaction of the practice of medicine. One of the essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity. For the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. And that is uh, the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions if there are any. Yes. You know, the study that you talked about uh, where, uh, where there was it's more intervention, there was increase in mortality. How did you find out if uh, the patients had the same level of disease when they had uh, more intervention? Mm -hmm. A very excellent question. So during our advanced statistics, what we do in a multivariate analysis, we adjust for disease severity. So as you said, whether the mortality was primarily related to disease severity versus uh, there was a resource strain or if the interventions that were performed were incorrect could be segregated based on the multivariate model that we do for our statistical advanced statistical analysis. And after adjusting for disease severity and the size of hospital, there was still unexplained uh, rise in mortality, which is attributed to just the variation in practice. So, so the the whole process is a statistical analysis rather than certain parameters that you choose. It's based on previous studies. You're deciding this patient basically had the same. This is a very just based on the statistical analysis that is based on a previous study. So, if I'm getting your question right, I want to understand the basically what what that. How does that statistical analysis work? Because I'm I'm thinking, like, was it truly the difference in disease severity that, uh, like, there was no disease severity and people were just doing extra management mm -hmm. that caused it? That's what I'm trying to understand. So maybe in the future, if I'm trying to do a study, I would understand the how would I manage the same situation. Right. So the study design is actually very crucial. So what we have here is the advantage of a longitudinal data. Our data stretches all the way from the beginning of 2020 all the way to now. Actually, it is a real-time database. What we did is compare how are the interventions in the beginning of the pandemic and how are interventions in the later half of the pandemic. And that's what we showed on the graphs. The graph at the top had multiple interventions and multiple clusters, whereas at the bottom of the graph, there were only two clusters. One cluster was following uh, good evidence-based medicine, the other was not. The standard of care, was actually adjusted and the interventions. As the pandemic progressed, the steroids became, as you know, one of the cornerstones of the treatment. And we adjusted for the time of the pandemic, we adjusted for disease severity, and we adjusted for the, the size of the hospital as well. The idea from the beginning of our inception of the virus registry was not to pinpoint at any hospital to say that, hey, you guys are doing things wrong. We want to be uh, uh, very collaborative and want to help them instead of pointing fingers to tell them, hey, the things that are you doing is, is incorrect. So what we did is we looked at a very high level uh, practices clusters. Certain clusters who were doing very well, the mortality was actually low. And the clusters which were doing multiple interventions, the mortality was actually high. So the, the data representation or the way we wanted to present data was uh, in a way wanting to be not uh, um, confrontational is if, if it, yeah. that's the right term, but we wanted it to be uh, uh, self-explanatory. You do too many things, the outcome is definitely going to be affected. The, the, the overall aim is to simply stick to the basics, whatever your best uh, available evidence is, doing less to the patient and doing more uh, is, is actually always better. One more question. There was a graph that throughout the time the mortality decreased. 
but it's adjusted for different variants of the COVID because as we know, the variants changed over time and it, I didn't read, follow the studies, but I heard that the uh, newer variants were less virulent, if that's the proper terminology for that. They tend to be more uh, infectious that you might catch them, but the overall mortality for those is much less. Now, there are multiple factors that could be attributing to it. Our knowledge uh, has actually definitely improved as the time has gone by. Uh, the virulence, although is higher, the overall mortality is lower. That is due to multiple effects. We are providing probably better care. We have understood the evidence a little bit better. The hospitals are not as strained as how it was before. The ICUs are not overwhelmed. So there are probably multiple factors that have actually contributed to it. And it would be difficult, very difficult to pinpoint if there was one aspect which has actually reduced it. And of course, the preventative care, which has definitely been beneficial. Thank you very much. Yep. Any other questions? Thanks, Randy. I'm Gerald Harmon, family medicine doctor in rural South Carolina, and uh, a member of the SMA board here for a couple of years. Chuck, a lot of you done a great job. Really like your entire commentary from start to finish. I like the way you started when you talked about misinformation, disinformation, and public health uh, needs and desires. I think all of your uh, the basic scientific data was really solid, and I think all it helps us in the front lines. The biggest issue, I think, many of us as physicians have found out over the last two and a half years now is that we have, I've used the term in a couple of uh, uh, presentations on behalf of another organization I'm associated with, of a, a pandemic of distrust. Not only have we had a viral pandemic, coronavirus pandemic, we've had a pandemic that was almost starting out before we had coronavirus. A little bit of distrust of organizations, maybe a polarization of various levels of, of attitudes and perspectives, almost to the point of Infecting public health. Mm -hmm. So I think your commentary initially was trying to define misinformation, which is a misinterpretation of peer reviewed evidence, versus disinformation, which is something that's almost done in a, uh, a malicious manner and maybe with a little bit of uh, self interest, where you use social media platforms to propagate the disinformation to one's advantage, perhaps even economically. Because if you have some of these social media websites and you're sponsoring things, you get recognition with so many hits, and as you get more and more hits, you get more and more economic advantage. People want to advertise on your social website because they want to hit a broad audience. And that really, there's a, a national campaign, and uh, some of us are a member of that national campaign to address deliberate disinformation and hold accountable our licensed physicians and providers that have, uh, by virtue of their licensing credentials, maybe board certification, uh, state and our national licenses, have a responsibility to public. To be arbiters of the truth and not disinformation for our economic gain. So I appreciate the way you set the tone for that, and I think you've done a good job with it. So, really, I'm sorry not to give you a lecture, but I want to applaud you for what you're doing and ask you if you've got more thoughts about that peer review science going forward. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, I couldn't have uh, said it any better. I think uh, the reason why I wanted to start off with that is uh, do no harm, which was on my last slide, is really uh, the crux of the matter. All of us in this room uh, went into healthcare and medicine with the intention of serving. And when we, our focus shifts from that uh, principle to personal gain or personal glory, uh, our attention could shift as well. And Unfortunately, the, the, the fourth revolution sometimes, as I mentioned, is a double-edged sword. Sometimes it could be beneficial and sometimes it, it may not be. And in the subsequent slide after, after what you were mentioning, you know, is that the disinformation actually continues to grow. And it takes a lot more effort to undo that compared to your real science. And I'm gonna briefly give you a short example. The, the vitamin C study, which was published a few years ago, uh, was a small cohort before and after study. And some people really took it to heart. 
After that, there have been multiple trials, multiple uh, randomized control uh, trials, which are done in multiple centers, which have actually found that there is no benefit. So to undo a poorly created uh, piece of evidence has actually cost taxpayers millions and millions of dollars to undo that uh, misinformation or disinformation, and we sometimes still struggle to um, to uh, get a good handle of that. So, what is the solution to it? I think improving transparency in research, uh, creating an environment where the evidence-based medicine is available to everybody, I think uh, is the way forward. But again, it boils down to the individual responsibilities and accountability, which cannot be replaced. That brought up something that I'm curious if came up at all in the analysis, and that's patient-directed care. Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm also a family doctor. I had a patient once ask me, he said, if I get this, will you write me hydroxychloroquine? I said, no, I won't. He said, I'll find a new doctor. I've been seeing this guy for years. I said, do you want to know why I wouldn't write it for you? Because I'll find a new doctor. I said, okay. I wouldn't write it for you because it's already been studied and it's shown not to help. I'd rather write you things that are shown to help and things that aren't. He goes, well, if it happens, I'll find a new doctor. I said, okay. I said, hey, uh, what do you want for your COPD today? I said, what do you mean? I haven't read this well in as long as I can remember. I said, I just figured if you want to pick your own medicines, maybe you'd want to change your inhalers too. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> um, but... I, I kind of like to know if some of the places that provided more care were also in areas, I mean, we had an issue where a hospital was sued to provide a specific care and a judge demanded that they provide this care for a patient, which seemed incredibly awkward. But did that come up at all in the research, um, political or patient direction of care? Yes, and it has come up multiple times. Um, and we wanted to put it to rest uh, by not just being argumentative with, with multiple bodies, but uh, we wanted to do good science and uh, performing transparent research and showing that, hey, this is what the evidence shows. Uh, and sometimes despite all that, you will come across individuals who just are not willing to change their mind. Now, what is the solution to that? And I think the, the only solution which I have personally found is to connect with individuals at, at their level. At the bottom of all this is an empathetic, uh, compassionate approach. Uh, a lot of these patients who come across, uh, or the families that come across, have uh, their loved ones who are critically ill, uh, sometimes holding on to a very thin line of hope. And anybody who throws them, hey, this could be, it could be uh, a life-saving treatment for uh, your X, Y, or Z. Why don't you try that? What I have found is sitting down with the family, and sometimes you may or may not have time, but sitting down with the family and listening to them. Hey, what do you think uh, about this? This is what I have. Print out some uh, literature for them. They might not be able to interpret it, but talking to them for a few minutes, sometimes repeatedly giving them the same message, a consistent message uh, in a, in a team-based approach, I have found sometimes useful. How things are going to evolve in the future, I think, is uh, is a bigger question. And that's why we have proposed a life dashboard, which I actually presented in, where the multiple stakeholders are actually part of the project. It is not only accessible to the people who develop guidelines, because for them, it is very black and white. For them, there is no ambiguity in that. For clinicians, the ambiguities increase a little bit, because some clinicians are very well versed with interpretation of evidence-based medicine, some are not. But a uh, transparent uh, dashboard would help with that for the clinicians who are not even able to interpret medical literature. But they just didn't stop with that. They made it publicly widely available so that the individuals who are your end users, so to say, the patients and the families, are actually able to go down on, onto that website and click, 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 find out what actually the information is. Is that going to be the solution against the dark web? Probably not, but I think we are taking a stepwise approach and the hope is that uh, the disinformation as the time goes will probably go down and the, the real research and the true data will speak for itself. I hope that that addresses your question. 
I'll be available to take any other questions as well. Uh, I have my uh, email listed on the slides as well. Please feel free to reach out. I want to thank again the opportunity to be here and, and uh, speak to you guys and meet the team at SME. We have a